Good morning, everyone. We're delighted to be here today, be part of your event. This is a cool thing to do the family day camp every year. The weather's a little bit nicer than last year and a lot cooler than last week, right? Last, the week ago was really, really hot. Yes, really, really hot. Good to, good to be with you today. We're going to have to head out uh, before lunch and come back for supper. One of our grandsons is having a violin recital. He's in Papa's mind, he needs to be like Isaac Stern. You know who Isaac Stern is? Well, close. <laughs> I love him that much, too. He's the violinist on Fiddler on the Roof. He played the Fiddler on the Roof. So if Judah can play, if it were a rich man for Papa someday, I would be a happy man. So we're going to encourage him today, learning the violin. He loves it. He's really, he loves playing in his cowboy boots. So he could be a cowboy Isaac Stern. I'm okay with that. Yeah. So we'll join you back for supper tonight and come back this evening. So um, good to have, good to be with you today. This is a delight to be here. I tell your pastor I love windows. I mean, not the kind that you can't look out. So don't everybody stare out them all day, or we'll have to frost them, or put blinds on them. Right. So I'm kind of a light person, and I appreciate that. Yeah. We love being with your church family, love your pastors and their wives, and glad to be here today. Uh, to be clear, we're going to talk about witnessing today, personal evangelism, bringing the gospel to people one-on-one. And a, a, couple of, a couple of thoughts before we begin. This needs to be personal and relational and intentional. And you might want to write that down. Witnessing should be personal, meaning one-on-one as a person, Relational meaning build relationship with people. The making of a disciple is the relational contact with a person one-on-one for life if God would allow that. And intentionally, we have to do it on purpose. It can become natural and organic, but most of the time we have to purpose we're going to do it and resolve we're going to do it and pray that God would bless. So I want to be clear. Uh, it, it's an important part of being a believer. Um, you look at 1 Corinthians 15, of first importance was the gospel. Revelation 2, the church of Ephesus that used to be a, a thriving, growing, reproducing church in the book of Ephesians. By the time we get to Revelation chapter 2, 35 years later, they're not in very good shape. So Jesus writes them a letter. He loves them. He commends them for being a good fundamental Baptist church. Well, think about it. They were hardworking. They were separatists. They were bore up under trial. They were a good funky church, but he had something against them. They'd abandoned the love they had at the first and had to go back into the first work, which was the Great Commission. So they had abandoned the Great Commandment and the Great Commission and were hanging by a friend. So you see, you need to remember from where you've fallen and repent and go back into the first work. So they strayed from their mission like a number of our churches have. It's a needed thing in, in our Christian life. And as I meet with churches, um, there are 95 church, 94 churches in the IARBC. Of them, 60 of them have called a new pastor in the nine years we've been doing this, 60 of them. And we get to work with most of them. We build friendship with churches and invite me to come in to help them walk them through calling a pastor. And I usually kind of ask them how they're doing as a church and strengths and weaknesses. And almost to a church, the struggle they have is getting the gospel to people, personally. And I'll ask them things like, how many people, how many adults have been saved in the last five years? And, and the typical answer, regardless of size of church, is typically none. So what are you doing to reach your community? Well, we hope they come and hope they come back. And, and that's a common plan, and not a biblical plan. And some, one church said, we don't have a plan. I said, well, we can talk about that. And they would admit the thing that they struggle with the most is sharing the gospel with people outside the walls of their church. Some believe that's the pastor's job to do that, to bring all the people in. We work with one pulpit pul- committee that said, what do, you, what do you want your new pastor to do when you call one? Bring all the people in. I said, wow, you think that's his job? <laughs> and, and I could be, I was good friends with them. I could be blunt with them. And they kind of scratched their head. I said, what kind of people? I don't know, just people need the pews filled. We weren't even particular. Saved, unsaved, didn't matter. Just we need bodies here. I said, wow, that's a great mission. 
As you know, he is to do the work of an evangelist, right? And so he's to be connecting with people and bringing the gospel to people. But as a shepherd, he's to equip you to do that. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that. And the deacon chair looked at me and he said, I've been wrong my whole life, what I thought a pastor should do. And that was a repentant moment. And they called a pastor who's doing it and teaching them to do it, and the church is really thriving and doing well. So that was a false expectation then, and their churches go, that's what you hire the pastor to do, is to bring the people in. But it's our responsibility. And I would say that as a believer, the things that we struggle with, I struggle with, is prayer, Bible reading, and witnessing would be the three biggest things that we struggle with. Are we faithful in church and faithful in giving? We struggle with those spiritual dynamics of witnessing. This is not to put you on a guilt trip, okay? It's not about, oh, the Holy Spirit conviction would be okay. And not to say that we have attained this. God has given us over the years of being in ministry uh, some seasons of fruit and seeing people come to Christ, experiences we want to share with you today. We've had seasons where we weren't as faithful as we should be. And it's amazing how people don't come to Christ when we're not purposely doing it. And I'm not proud of those times of life, and you know them. Life is busy and routine and all the stuff that we do, and a burden for lost people just doesn't seem to be forefront in my mind. And I've been content for a while, not reaching out to lost people. Then there have been times where God has worked in our heart, had a burden for lost people, and um, it's amazing how many lost people you have a burden for when you start wanting to reach them and you pray for them. So from our experience, good and bad, I want to share with you from the word, from our heart, what witnessing could look like. And, and I know you're thinking, oh, me? Yep, all of, if you know Christ as your Savior, Christ has called us to testify of him to lost people. You know, that is the Great Commission, part of it. Uh, to make a disciple is to make a believer. And then baptize them and teach them to go make believers, disciples of believer. And so it's part of the Great Commission is bringing the gospel to people and then baptizing them and teaching them to go do the same with other people. It's replicative, it's reproductive. And, and I know that terrifies us, go, I'm happy coming to church and paying my tithe and serving in Sunday school, but talking to an unsaved person outside of church, okay, that's terrifying. I remember knocking on doors and hoping nobody was home. You know, driven kind of by guilt, and we had, back in the day at Bethany, we had 85 Awana kids. Church of 35 people to begin with, and 85 Awana kids. So Doug Fair and I visited all the Awana families. All the people, and I, I would knock on the door, hoping that nobody was home. Saw a light, and i go, oh, man. I might have to actually talk to them. <laughs> I remember those, that was the, driven by guilt and a little bit of duty, but not actually wanting to be with around lost people. I remember and I still have some of that. And some of the fear, that's one fear, is just I don't know what to say. And we have our fears, and uh, it, say maybe it's too hard, it's going to be a lot of work, which it will. Or I tried and it didn't work, <laughs> gave them a tract and didn't come to church, get caught up in routine of life and busy. We just hope they come, and if we're attractive enough, they'll just flock here, right? <laughs> right? How's that working for you? Now, God might bring lost people here. They might walk in and hope that you're not mad. Like Paul said, you walk in and things are chaotic and they'll think you're... So God, they might come here and, and we have to steward that well. As a visitor, as a, someone looking and God drawing, we have to steward that well. And so I find a way to connect with them maybe outside the walls of our church. But for the most part, it takes place out there. And that's how God designed it to be. And we have to get away from just hoping they come be attractive to the unsaved, and God will just bring them here. We have to get away from that idea of bringing the gospel to people. Sometimes we're just content with our life. Your life is good, and our church is going well. We have a good pastor, and uh, we have missionaries and good programs, and we're content with that. And sometimes it's not a burden for lost people because we're never around them or don't see them as lost. We're around lost people all the time, Right? Neighbors, friends, people that do business, your taxidermist, 
You have a taxidermist, right? <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> Some of the fixes your mower, some of the checks out your groceries, some of serves you at a restaurant, right? We have people all the time. And we get a burden when we see them as lost people. Right. Now, Jesus, when he went around the cities and villages in Matthew 9, he said he saw the multitudes and was moved with compassion. His innards heard for them. A sheep without a shepherd. Now, there were people of different occupations and ages of life, but he saw them spiritually as people without a shepherd needing him. And so his heart ache for them. So being around lost people, seeing them as lost, changes how we interact with them. Paul talked about being a new creation in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5. And part of that being a new creation is says, we henceforth know no man according to the flesh. You no longer, no longer see people just as human beings. We have a soul that goes to heaven or doesn't. Now before Sandy and I were saved, we were good religious moral do-gooders like Cornelius. That was us. And I judge people on how, if they're better or worse than me. Church going, not church going. Moral, immoral. Smoker, non-smoker. Drinker, non-drinker. And I felt better when they were not like me. But that's how I judge people. When, he, when Sandy and I came to Christ, we saw them as saved and lost. That changed like that, like a flip of a switch. That was part of being a new creation. And we now instinctively saw people as saved and lost not church going or non church going. I remember sitting in our Lutheran church on the big days of Easter and, and Christmas and hoping the pastor would really hammer the people that came only those two days of the year because I was there most every Sunday, except during pheasant hunting season. <laughs> and I said, Go get them! And he wouldn't. I'm going, Oh man, that was the judgmental, the Pharisee part of me. And then I saw them as saved and lost. That changed, and it should be instinctively natural. Now, now that I'm saved, maybe people I know are not saved. And that created in us, initially, we're saved at the age of 28 and 26, respectively, um, a burden for people that we knew that were probably not believers, because we didn't get it till we got it, by the grace of God. We had our early experiences witnessing to people in our world, one of which was her sister and her husband. So we... we Planned to go up and see them in Bloomington, Minnesota, and drove up for the purpose of sharing Christ with them. They were, we were good Lutherans, they were bad Lutherans. Well, they were. I mean, you were church going, <laughs> they weren't. That's how you measure that, right? We sang in choir, they didn't. But now they're lost. Right? We went up to have supper with them, and we had just moved here from. Uh, from Alaska to go to Bible college, just gotten saved, and uh, pray that God would open a door for the gospel. So we had supper with them, and we're praying that God would open a door of conversation, and nothing. Sat in the living room, nothing. Standing at the door, ready to leave. The Spirit of God says, you're not done. I said, yeah, I know I'm working on that. So I said, can I ask you a question to Ron and Linda? They said, sure. I said, do you consider yourself to be a Christian? Now, that's not a good question to ask, but that's my early days. And I said, yes. I thought, well, who doesn't? Okay, so I said, can I ask you another different question? They said, yeah. Do you consider yourself to be born again? It's a better question. And they said, no. I said, why would you say that? They said, well, our pastor says you don't need to be. I'm going, hmm. I read enough of John chapter 3 to know that whatever it is, you must have it. Yeah. Whatever the new birth is, you have to have that or you don't go to heaven. I stand there, okay, okay we're, we'll leave. <laughs> and the Spirit of God says, you're not done. I said, no, I'm working on it. <laughs> and I said, you know, Jesus said, you must be born again. That would mean your pastor is wrong. And I said that. And they kicked us out of the house. I said, don't ever talk about that again. But our first witnessing experiences, right? Isn't that great? I'm not sure it would have done any different in our early stages than a woman who was at the well, went and told people, I found the Messiah, and people got saved because of her testimony, and that's okay. We're not promised that it bears fruit in them coming to Christ. I was faithful. Um, we're as far as we know they're not saved yet. I worked at UPS back in the day, and um, Mark Sherwood and I was a fellow faith student. We had Terry with us. He was a non-believing supervisor. The three of us carpooled to work at 10 o'clock at night, 3.30 in the morning. Someone knows about that, right? Yeah, yeah, just a little bit about that. 
And so Terry was kind of a captive audience, kind of like Paul in a Philippian jail, chained to guards, a guard chained every four hours. Guess who the prisoner was? It wasn't Paul. Guess what they got for four hours? The gospel. You know how we know? Because it went to Caesar's household at the end of Philippians chapter 4. He said the gospel isn't bound. It's actually advanced the gospel, my imprisonment. And so he was not quite chained to us, but we gave him the gospel and kindly. And Terry was a Lutheran like we were, so I understood his thinking. And he said, I told him it's salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, not the church, not good works, not sacraments. Only through faith in Christ. He said, if what you're telling me is true, that would mean my church and my pastor are wrong. And I just can't bring myself to believe that. So we pleaded with him for weeks. Uh, I don't know that he ever came to Christ. Maybe he did someday, but that was our witnessing early on. I kind of like guns, so I... Back in the day, during my Bible college days, I would go up to the Polk County uh, shooting range, and uh, my dad would hand load my 30 out six loads for me to see which ones my gun liked, because they have to test them. So he would, it was legal to mail them at the time, okay? This is before all the hazardous material stuff. So he would load with different amounts of grain and different bullets, give me four different ones to see which one the gun liked and group the best. So I would go up and shoot before we go hunting with him. And I got to know the range master, Dave. And I had a burden for Dave. I shared the gospel with Dave, and he wasn't interested and rejected it, though we were friends. And, but we had a burden for people because we were now believers. It should, to some degree, be instinctive. You think of the woman at the well. What's the first thing she did? She ran to the city and said, I found the Messiah. And they believed because of her testimony. She knew nothing about how to share him except what she knew. So beyond... That is something that we must do. Is something we should instinctively want to do by seeing people as lost people. And so we have our fears, and I know we're fear of rejection, of not knowing what to say. We'll talk about that a little bit tonight, today, and tonight. There'll be a set, part one and part two. Ever thought about this fear? What if they're interested? Ever thought about that? The fear of what do you do if they want you to be the one to share Christ with them? You're thinking, oh, rejection. I'm prepared for that. What if they say, like Philip and the eunuch, I have questions, you're the person, sit here with me, I need to know what's going on with this, and you're the person. That's going to happen eventually, and you'll be that person. So we all have in our mind what witnessing could look like, and I want to look at Acts chapter 8, so turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Uh, this account of Philip and the eunuch. And in your notes it says, we know, we know that God has called us to witness. We know that we should witness. We know that we've commanded to do it. We're to make disciples. We're to testify of him. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you shall testify of me and speak of him. It means to speak of Christ and without apology, with confidence, because we know it's true. We verbally testify of him and begin in Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And so this, the, the, the book of Acts is the spread of the gospel through Jerusalem, Judea, and now it's in Samaria. This is the fulfillment of what Jesus wanted them to do. So Philip has been in Samaria preaching publicly. Uh, he's a deacon, one of the deacons, I think, from Acts chapter 6. And uh, speaking publicly, people coming to Christ, and one co co confronting one that made a profession that wasn't genuine. And God takes him away from that to put him with one person on a road in a chariot. Interesting. So away from this public ministry, which many of us will never probably have, he puts him in contact with a person. So this is the first time in the book of Acts we have a conversation recorded of a believer and an unbeliever. We've seen many people saved in Acts chapter 2. It said people were saved every day. The number became 5,000 disciples. And we're going, this great, you know, public preaching. And, but how did, what did that look like at a personal level? Now we know. Here's an example, the first time in the book of Acts. It's a book with um, precedents that are set. I think it's a good precedent pattern of we could do what Philip did by the Spirit of God. So let's begin reading in chapter 8, beginning of verse 25 of the book of Acts. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching, proclaiming the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road 
that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. Now he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the Isaiah the prophet and asked him, do you understand what you are reading? He said, how can I unless someone guides me? He invited Phil to come and sit with him. We'll stop there. So I want to look, this is very instructive. Now, narratives are tricky because there's no admonitions here, nothing to do. So we have to pull out of it what could be relevant to us. And beyond the spread of the gospel to Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth, I think the eunuch probably took the gospel to North Africa, went back. The gospel spread to the uttermost part. But there's something personal here to glean from a narrative. And so I want to pull from here things that we could do, what witnessing could look like. So number one in your notes, number one in your notes, is we have to go where God sends us. We have to go where God sends us. So first of all, he said to go to the south and then go to this person. So we have to be goers, not expecting them to come. That's a huge shift in thinking from the old model of just hoping they all come. And some churches still embrace that, and I think it's a mistake to do that. God may bring them here. Uh, when we pastored in Carroll for 24 years, about two-thirds of people saved were visitors to church. God brought them here, but none of them were saved at church. We had to go to them in their homes and their homes to bring the gospel to them. So we have to be goers and not expect them to come. Uh, we are sent. Jesus said, the Father sent me, so send I you. In fact, the Great Commission to make disciples... That's the main verb, is to make believers, make followers of Christ. By going, by baptizing, by teaching is a grammatical instruction of that. These are what we call participles. Are you're going to get today by English instruction. But that's how you parse it out. We make disciples by going and by baptizing, by teaching. And by going means in the process of going, or as you go from here, we make a disciple. In the process of going and living out our life, we bring the gospel to people and they respond to the gospel. We do it by going. And you say, you go someplace every single day, we go places. In the process of going, as we go from here, we make disciples. So we have to be people that believe we're sent. And first of all, that's God's plan for us. That's his plan that we as redeemed sinners be bringing the gospel to people. That's his plan. I'm a former engineer, civil engineer for five years. We built a couple of hydro plants, one in Washington State, one in Ketchikan, Alaska. Loved it. God brought us the gospel, saved us, and brought us to Ankeny and been pastoring ever since. But I can't shed the engineer in me. You just can't. So I love your building. <laughs> this is really well designed. And I noticed badly poured concrete, and my wife says, learn to deal with that. How did they get away with that? Who possibly could have approved that? I'm just, I can be a little critical, but you get it, right? And when the road's like this, how did they get away with porpoising on the road? It's a brand new piece of concrete. We would never have, so I'm sorry. I can't shed the engineer in me. And engineers always overbuild, which isn't bad, because we have a little... A bridge over Deer Creek, east of Ankeny, where we live, and it says five ton maximum. That's, that's 10,000 pounds. Our exterior and camper were 9,500. 9, we, we max it out. You know what's been across that bridge? Yeah. Sod trucks, yeah. concrete pumper trucks. Yeah. Probably 50, 60,000. Aren't you glad the engineers overbuild? Yes. Nod your head. Yes. This is why we do that. <laughs> Amen. I have a, huh? Amen. Amen. And it just got rebuilt so it doesn't collapse. So we're good. Um, I have a slot car racing set in my basement uh, for the children of all ages, four lanes, 132nd scale. And I build a table that supports on It could double as a tornado shelter. I don't apologize for that. I can stand on it, crawl on it, and it won't collapse. And we always have plan A, B, C, D, and E just in case, right? 
Well, God doesn't have a plan B. You and I are it. The angels aren't his plan. Believers redeemed sinners, and God put his gospel in these jars of clay. So the glory goes to him. We are his plan to bring his message to people. We are the ones with the beautiful feet, the bearers of the good news, the ambassadors sent to those entrusted with the message and the ministry of reconciliation. God entrusted that to us. And how will they believe if they don't hear? How will they hear if we don't proclaim? How will they proclaim unless they're sent? Well, we have been sent. Not everyone will believe, it says in Romans 10, but we are the means by which he gets the gospel from the word to people. And Romans chapter 10 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And the word there doesn't mean the word of God. It means the words of Christ we speak to them from his word. God needs human messengers. He's designed it that way. That's why he needed Jonah. The book of Jonah is not a book about second chances that God would do anything because he needs a messenger. Swallowed by a whale, spit up on the beach. He had to have a, even a reluctant, unwilling message. He needs a messenger. And we're it. Now he uses his word and his spirit to convict of sin and open people's heart, but he uses us, which is terrifying and humbling all at the same time. And he put that treasure in us, these little broken jars of clay to bring the gospel to people because we know it's true. That's his plan. Number two, we go in his power. We have no power to convict of sin, to make them understand. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to convict of sin, to point them to Christ, to illuminate their heart, bring about the new birth. He uses his word and his spirit in a mysterious way to bring about the new birth. So we go in his power divinely enabled, asking for wisdom and what to say and how to say it and how to illustrate and to be clear, but he, he uses it through his power. It doesn't take long to realize that you can't make someone understand the gospel and you just you want to say, why don't you get this? So you hold, you hold a blind person close to the picture, why don't you see this? Because they're blind. And you wish you could do it, and you can't. You work hard at being clear, and being kind and persuasive, but only God can quicken the spirit and, and shine light in darkness. All of us about the work of God and salvation. It's all of him. But we have a duty to bring the message, but we know we can't do it, so we pray hard that God would do a work and give us wisdom and a burden for them and an open heart, and you can see when it happens. And so you realize quickly that we needed the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, you'll receive power, divine enablement by the institute, and then you can witness for me. And so we go in his power. Uh, we pastored in Bethany in South Des Moines years ago. Lived right in the street. You lived in that house for a while, didn't you? Yeah. Great location. We figured, what, 100,000 cars a day? I counted them one night. <laughs> Theoretically, it was my little mental computer model. It was a hot night, newer conditioning, and I said, if there were like so many cars an hour, so many hours, it'd be 100,000 cars a day. That's what you do when you're hot and can't sleep. Okay, it's like Nebuchadnezzar, give me a book to read, you know. It's like that was my version of that. Um, so we were, there were people that wandered up and down Southeast 14th, Beaver Dam, bar was over there thumping, boom, 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 every Friday and Saturday night, people on foot and people coming in asking for help. One day a young lady walked up and um, she, we met her and we were homeschooling our kids, so we're careful but want to be open. So you're balancing, protecting from people walking in the streets to how do you help them and uh, you pray for wisdom in that. And so she walked up to the door and couldn't look at us and looked like she needed to, someone to talk to. Let her in the house and you're kind of protective and you just don't know what's gonna happen. And she said, by the way, I'm a witch. I didn't laugh. I said, I believe you. And she was in contact with demonic spirits and knew too much to not be true for her. And uh, she said, I'm scared. I'm going down a black hole. I'm never going to come out. Could you help me? She couldn't look at us. She looked at the floor. Her name was Candace. 
And I'm thinking, oh, what do you do here? So I consulted the witch class. They took it faith, you know, like witch 101. You know, and you're, going, you're kind of going, eh, it's not there. And the Lord just says, just give her the gospel. The gospel will set her free. She's a captive of the devil, right? And so the gospel will set her free. So we talked about Christ. We talked about the devil. She says, oh, I know how he works. He gives you power, then he makes you his slave and destroys you. I said, yes. She understood. We sat in the living room with our kids kind of behind a little bit and shared Christ with her. How Jesus loved her, died, would set her free if she would trust him to be her savior. And she did in her living room. She looked at us for the first time and there was like light in her eyes. You could see it. Only God can do that. I remember one of my early preaching times as a student at faith. Uh, desperate churches called the college and asked for student preachers. I mean, that was us. <laughs> I said, boy, they must be desperate to call and ask for student preachers. So I was on the list to go out, and we happily went out. It was a great experience, and it was a winter day, and we had our old Delta 88 copper-colored vinyl top, just classic, you know. It weighed, it weighed like 9,000 pounds. It was really heavy. And so we, it was a snowy winter day, but if you go up in Minnesota, if the interstate's open, you drive, right? You don't stop. You're the preacher that day. So we plowed through the snow on I-80 and I and went to a little Whatcher, Iowa, and I was a preacher for the day. I had one sermon I prepared for homiletics class on John, on John 10, right? John 10, about I'm the, I'm the good shepherd. Uh, anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. It's an evangelistic message. So I, I gave, and of course, you're happy but terrified at the same time because you're not used to preaching much and showed up and had my notes and it went through and seemed to go okay and got done and breathed a little sigh of relief and said, Phew. I'm thinking, oh, what's next? Ah, invitation. So I didn't say it out loud. <laughs> invitation. So I said, is there anyone, and they had a middle row, which used to be a Baptist distinctive, I think, and is no longer. <laughs> There used to be a center row here, and over here, I said, if anyone wants to come to Christ, come forward, I'd love to talk with you. Now I'm done. And right over here was a mom and her teenage daughter, and got up and started walking, I'll pretend this, started walking down the front, and I thought, I wonder what they want. <laughs> and you're sitting about there, right? Uh, this is our seat, by the way, if you ever come back here, these two seats are our seat, we paid for them. We were, we were happy to move as long as we got them back. And she's thinking, I wonder what they want. <laughs> Going, what in the world? And, and they stood up here in the, in the pole. I said, what do you want? She says, I want to be saved. I said, you do? I, I was flabbergasted. And I didn't know what to do. I said, want to talk to your mom? Sure. So I took her mom back here, and her mom led her to Christ. Only God can do that. So we go in his power. We go... Personally, we go, now God has charged the church with the Great Commission. But the church is made of individuals because the church isn't evangelistic. People are. You can have a culture where we do it, but it's, it's we go personally versus the church. We go to a place. God will send you to a place. Look at our text in Acts chapter 8. He said, go to the south, verse 26, this is a desert place. So he, he, he speaks to Philip, the Spirit of God, leading Philip, speaking not audibly today, but speaking to go to this place. God will direct you to a place. Now, we're, we all are in different places. We have a neighborhood a place, where you work is a place, where you play basketball is a place, where you have play sports is a place. God sends us to places. Now, we believe that God is sovereign, Right? You're there by God's appointment. So you're there in that place because God puts you there. It could be your neighborhood or your work environment or who, you, who is in your world, who fixes your mower, who uh, winterizes your camper. Those are people God has stewarded to. God puts you to, into a place. And you, you believe that God has sent you there. Now, you had a realtor and you had this, but God puts you there. Do you believe that? So he sends us to a place, not, but he directs us to a place. Then he sends us to a person in that place. That's the next point. So here we have a place with lots of people. Now this is, 
the Gaza Road is like I-35 coming, you know, going up and down Iowa. This is the, the major trade route in that part of the world. This is not the only guy on the road. Even if it was, he's not the only guy in this entourage. He's not driving the horses, and he's got other people guarding the treasure. So who do you reach in a place? God will single them out. He will burn you for a person in a place. So you realize places are there by God's appointment. And, but you have lots of neighbors and lots of co-workers. You pray, God, who would you have me build a friendship? Open a door with someone in this place because you may not be able to reach all of them. But God will burden you. If you pray that way, God will send you to a person in another place. He'll burden you for them, and he will sing to them, I trust me on this. This is what happened here. And not everybody was reached, but a person was. I remember missionary appeals at faith, and I, I get it, and five billion people in the world to reach, they had no effect on me. Because five billion people is beyond my understanding. I can't reach five billion people. I can't be burdened for that many, but I can reach the guy that I shoot at the range with. Or maybe a gal who checks out my groceries at Hy-Vee. So we homeschooled our kids living in the parsonage on Southeast 14th, and her world was that. That was her world, right? Her world of homeschooling the kids, being a pastor's wife, and discipling people. But I want to connect with lost people. How do I do that when this is my job? But I go shopping every week at Hy-Vee. We learned that living up in Alaska to go grocery shopping once a week. She'd fly into town in the float plane and fly back with a box of groceries, have a meal plan. Those are really organized. We're, we're a mess today. We're getting better. <laughs> But meals were planned. You know, we had the meal planning, uh, the, the, the cash went in the envelope, that was the budget for the week, and once a week, Wednesday afternoon was shopping day for the whole week. None of this run to the convenience store stuff. Um, those were the, some of the good old days. So every Wednesday afternoon became shopping day at Hy-Vee, and so Sandy said, give me someone to connect with in my world of being a mom. And so she met Marilyn. And just had a burden for Marilyn, went through various lines, and Marilyn kind of came up on her radar and began to talk with Marilyn and say, what would you say? Hi, I'm Sandy. What's your Marilyn? Hi, Marilyn. Nice to meet you. That was probably it the first day. Could we do that? The first thing was, not if you were to die today, you don't say that to a stranger unless you're going to die. <laughs> Why would you start there? Jesus didn't. Did he? Could you give me a drink? is what he said. Do you understand what you're reading? So you begin with where you are. So now she purposes to go through Marilyn's line every week, even if other lines are open. She waits for her. So every week, week after week, Wednesday afternoon, was, hi, Marilyn, how did your week go? How are you doing this small talk how about your kids? And it went on for a couple of months. One week she went by and said, Marilyn, how are you doing? Not so good. Why is that? My husband Bill's in the hospital, and they've got him hooked to all sorts of tubes, and I have no idea what's wrong with him, and I'm really scared. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> you know what she said? Could Tim go see him? Volunteers me, without my knowledge. <laughs> it's okay. You know what she said? He would do that? There's the rejection, right? Huh? It's happened more than once. Yes, he would do that. Went to see Bill, had never met Marilyn, never met Bill. Found him in the hospital, and he was hooked up to tubes. It looked threat. So I, I said, Bill, we don't know what this is going to go. Do you know if you're going to heaven? And he didn't. And Bill put his trust in Christ in his hospital room. That's when you say, if you were to die today, do you go to heaven, right? And so Bill put his trust in Christ. We did a John study with them uh, on that little porch outside, you know, with a little... Thing. We did a Bible study and confirmed that Bill had trusted Christ and Marilyn trusted Christ, and they had friends. They're open to the gospel. That turned the corner at Bethany for us through a contact with a person in a place, and this is how we go. We go speaking about the person. We go to a person. We go about the person of Christ. We get to not just the gospel, but we introduce them to Jesus. It's about the person of Christ, not just... The, the, the theology of the gospel, do you, you want to meet Jesus? One who loved you, died for you, and so I want to introduce you to him. 
as the one who can save you. And of course, we go praying. We, we go, Paul prayed for boldness and for open doors and for a free course of the gospel. Maybe that's why he was bold. He asked people to pray for him. And so you pray that God would give you wisdom and how, how hard to press, maybe when to back off and how to illustrate and what to do and, and to know where they are. And you pray for wisdom and boldness and open doors and understanding. And you go because only God can save them. You go praying for them. You pray for clarity, and you go providentially, meaning God working. What, I, and see, what you see in this passage is God working by giving a divine appointment. Here is the eunuch being drawn by the Spirit. How do we know? Because he's been to Jerusalem at great expense, had a copy of Isaiah, coincidentally, air quotes, reading Isaiah, where is the clearest thing in the Gospel in the Old Testament. So how much did that cost him? Where did he get it? He's seeking, the, God is drawing him to, to his son, and God is sending Philip to him. So God providentially having this divine appointment of someone he's drawing, someone he's directing, and it just happens. We go expecting God's going to do that. It won't happen every time, and we have a duty to bring the gospel to people whenever we can. But on occasion, there's a providential directing and drawing where you meet up with someone God is working in their heart, and it doesn't take long for that to, to, to see that. We go providentially. We were in, uh, in South Des Moines, to give us another illustration. We homeschooled our kids, and uh, Clarence Townsend from Grandview Park Baptist Church was the overseer. It was legal, illegal to homeschool kids of the day. In the early days of homeschooling, not many people did it, and the laws were kind of nebulous, and we had... Betty Winger, we had to get, her, get her out of, kids out of the state if we had to. It's really tricky to homeschool. And so Grandview Park hired Clarence Townsend to be a homeschool supervisor. He's certified. So that became our legal. He come by once a, once a month and say, you're doing just fine. I said, I don't think so. No, you're doing just fine. So I guess we were doing okay. And so through that contact, he had a couple approach him there were not believers looking for a church. He said, go to Tim and Sandy Church. They're homeschooled parents, and maybe you'd want to meet them. So Bill and Kelly show up one day through Clarence, and uh, they come to church, and Bill is a former military. He's a current lead helicopter pilot for Mercy Air Life. That's his job. He's flown Chinook helicopters in Australia. Pretty intelligent guy, sharp wife, two young boys, and they visit our church. They just came and said, hey, Clarence Townsend. And I said, okay, I followed up and went to see them the next week. And so I'm visiting with them in their living room, and we get talking about things and realize that he's searching. And he, he's tried Buddhism and Hinduism and every ism you can think of. He's searching for truth and not finding it. So I began to talk about the gospel, and I thought, this could take a while. And so the, she's, I can be oblivious at times, but I smell dinner cooking. The one time I wasn't oblivious to what's happening around me. And I said, Kelly, this could take all. She said, dinner can burn. I said, okay, now I have permission. And so we went into the gospel and talked about how Christ gets, and they both trusted Christ in their living room. And we were struggling at the moment. I said, Lord, give us someone to work with. And God gave us Bill and Kelly. And so their sons got saved. We did bike ride Bible studies down the green belt over in West Des Moines, Urbandale-ish, and we do bike, side, bike ride, Bible studies, and uh, God providentially brought us together. Do you believe God could do that? Is he still doing that? So we go providentially. I'm going to stop there. I knew this would take longer to do this part of it today, but we'll finish this tonight. Uh, that what can, this is what witnessing, we go where God sends us and trust him to use us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for saving us, those that have come to Christ. You did a work in bringing us the gospel of someone who cared, someone who prayed, someone who loved us. Someone may be terrified to even risk sharing Christ with us. And you brought us to your son and convicted us of sin. We put our trust in him and everything was new. Help us never forget that moment, that time we were made new creations in him. Father, give us a burden for lost people. 
to go without fear, to go trusting you, to use us as you send us, to, to tell us to go, to, that we are sent. We trust you to providentially bring us into people's lives, to bring the gospel to them. Use us, we pray in a mighty way, in Jesus' name. Amen.